During the early Triassic period, before the evolution of the dinosaurs, the apex predator of southern Pangaea was Proterosuchus. It looked similar to a crocodile with a longer neck and a hooked snout that formed a massive overbite. Proterosuchus is known to the public at large mostly from its appearance in BBC's Walking with Monsters, although it was called Chasmatosaurus during the program. While Proterosuchus was a terror in its own time, it was also a herald of what was to come. It was part of the clade Archosauriformes, the clade which includes dinosaurs, crocodilians, and their close relatives who already had most of the traits that set them apart from other reptiles. Proterosuchus was one of the first archosauriforms to reach large body size. It was also one of the first new species to evolve after the Permian mass extinction, the most devastating extinction event known to science. Combined with a number of good specimens, Proterosuchus is uniquely informative in understanding the rise of one of the most important groups of reptiles. So, what was Proterosuchus itself actually like? It was about three and a half meters long and held its limbs in a sprawling stance. While this is similar to most other reptiles, the limbs of more derived archosaur forms were usually held in a more erect stance. Proterosuchus's skull was large, deep, and filled with recurved, serrated teeth. This proportionately large skull is thought to have been the result of Proterosuchus evolving to hunt larger prey in the wake of the extinction of most of the top Permian carnivores. Some of the later, more derived archosaur forms, such as the Erythrosuchids, took this a step further, possessing almost comedically oversized skulls. Perhaps the most prominent feature of Proterosuchus's skull is the long, hooked snout and its resulting overbite. While a hooked snout is also present in some other early archosaur forms and their relatives, Proterosuchus is one of the most extreme examples. As for what it was used for, the snout was highly resistant to bending and created a notch comparable to those in Conagra eels, Spinosaurids, and Crocodilians. However, Proterosuchus's teeth do not have similar wear patterns as these taxa. It could be that the notch was merely a byproduct of the downturned snout, which Proterosuchus used to keep its prey from escaping. Another possibility is that the snout could have been a display feature used to attract mates. Another key feature of the skull was the antortable fenestra, an opening in the skull in front of the eyes. While perhaps less striking than the hooked snout, this feature is one of the identifying traits of archosaur formes. While most extinct reptiles are assumed to have been ectothermic or cold-blooded, this was not the case for Proterosuchus. Examination of its bone histology shows that its metabolism was much higher than most reptiles, instead being closer to that of endothermic or warm-blooded species. Indeed, a high metabolism seems to have been an ancestral trait in archosaur formes, with most other members, including dinosaurs and even the ancestors of crocodilians possessing a high metabolism. While an endothermic metabolism requires a lot more energy to maintain, there are several reasons why it is advantageous. For example, it allows an animal to be much more active and to inhabit colder environments. Animals with a high metabolism are able to grow much faster than those with lower metabolisms. In Proterosuchus's case, in a single year, it was able to reach two-thirds of its full adult size. In contrast, the ectothermic Komodo dragon takes at least eight years to reach its full size, despite being slightly smaller. Such quick growth is thought to be helpful in unpredictable conditions like those during the Permian mass extinction and its aftermath in the early Triassic. Indeed, 
The other major group of large vertebrates to survive the extinction, the synapsids, were also endothermic. Furthermore, out of all the synapsids, the survivors were only from the two clades with the highest metabolisms, the tusked dicynodonts and the more mammalian eutherodonts. However, when compared to other members of Archosauriformes, Proterosuchus's metabolism was still rather low. While early Archosauriforms did have lower metabolisms than many of the later ones, Proterosuchus's metabolic rate was even lower than that of Prolacerta, who was not even a true Archosauriform, but a close relative of the group. This suggests that Proterosuchus evolved to have a lower metabolism than its direct ancestors, although it remained higher than most other reptiles. While not as large as the later Triassic carnivores, such as Erythrosuchids or Rawasuchids, let alone many of the later theropod dinosaurs, there is no question that Proterosuchus was capable of hunting the largest prey of the earliest Triassic. The question is how it killed them. Proterosuchus has variously been proposed to have been a terrestrial hunter or a semi-aquatic predator analogous to crocodilians, which is how it was portrayed in Walking with Monsters. Among the evidence used to support an amphibious mode of hunting is the shape of its brain cast. Proterosuchus's olfactory bulbs, which were responsible for its sense of smell, were smaller than those of closely related species, and are instead more like those of crocodilians. Also like crocodilians, the length of the coacular ducts in its ears suggest it was best adapted for detecting low-frequency sounds. Some paleontologists have suggested that the neutral position of Proterosuchus's head, inferred from its ear canals, would have been stilted upward. Such a position is ideal for a semi-aquatic predator, as it would leave its nostrils above the water while the rest of the body remained obscured beneath it. However, the connection between ear canals and the neutral position of the head is looser than was thought when this idea was first proposed. There are also arguments against an amphibious Proterosuchus. Crocodilian nostrils are on the top of the snout, which allows them to easily remain above the water. Because of Proterosuchus's hooked snout, its nostrils were angled much lower than in most terrestrial species. Even if they were angled above the water, its head would have been much easier to see than a crocodilian's. Proterosuchus also lacks many of the other morphological traits that make crocodilians so effective in the water. For instance, when swimming, a crocodilian's primary source of propulsion is its large tail, which is tall and flattened. In contrast, the shape of Proterosuchus's tail was more like that of terrestrial reptiles. Its recurved and serrated teeth are also typical of terrestrial archosauriforms, as opposed to the straight and conical teeth in most semi-aquatic ones. This means that, even if Proterosuchus caught its prey in a manner similar to crocodilians, it would have killed them with more direct wounds rather than drowning them. Furthermore, its bone histology and the ossification of its legs were more like those of terrestrial species. The environment Proterosuchus lived in was also arid and prone to droughts. While crocodilians do sometimes live in similar climates, Proterosuchus is the only known large predator in the region for much of the time it lived, making a semi-aquatic mode of existence a questionable strategy in such conditions. Finally, its metabolism was also higher than that of most other semi-aquatic predators. A high metabolism is far from ideal for an aquatic ambush predator, as it would result in a lot of wasted energy while simply waiting for prey to approach. However, a lower metabolism might have meant Proterosuchus would have been unable to grow fast enough to deal with the unstable world of the early Triassic. 
Therefore, its comparatively high metabolism may have been a compromise between two different evolutionary considerations. Additionally, if it was a crocodile analog, this would explain why its metabolism was so low for an archosaur form. Another explanation is that there simply weren't enough large herbivores to support a fully endothermic carnivore of its size. Overall, while not definitive, the evidence does not seem to strongly suggest that Proterosuchus was an amphibious predator, although it cannot yet be ruled out. If it was a semi-aquatic predator, it does not seem to have been as well adapted for the role as crocodilians, perhaps because it was still in the early stages of adapting to the niche. Regardless of how adult Proterosuchus hunted, it would seem that the juveniles behaved differently. Their skulls were far less robust, closer to those of their more primitive relatives, such as Prolacerta. Also like them, the back teeth were not curved as strongly as those in the front, in contrast to the more uniform teeth of the adults. As their skulls were similar to their smaller relatives, it is likely the juvenile Proterosuchus lived accordingly. Once they reached larger size, and gained their proportionally larger skulls, they shifted to hunting larger species. This mirrors the changes today's crocodilians go through as they grow. While Proterosuchus has been treated as one species so far, it was actually a genus that consisted of at least three similar species. Proterosuchus fergusi is the type species, and is the one known from the most fossils. The other two species, Proterosuchus gaurai and Proterosuchus alexanderi, are only known from one specimen each. Proterosuchus alexanderi had a longer snout. The skull of Proterosuchus gaurai had a small, toothless gap in the upper jaw before the transition to the hooked snout. All three species have only been found in early Triassic rocks from South Africa. However, most early Triassic fossils are from South Africa, and the world's continents were combined into the megacontinent of Pangaea at the time, so Proterosuchus was likely far more widespread. Fossils of a species similar to Proterosuchus have also been found in early Triassic India. It may even be Proterosuchus itself. There may be a fourth species of Proterosuchus. The type species of the Chasmatosaurus genus, Chasmatosaurus von Hopeni, turned out to instead be a specimen of Proterosuchus for Guernsey, which is why Proterosuchus was called Chasmatosaurus in Walking with Monsters. While this means Chasmatosaurus is no longer a valid genus, another species formally assigned to it, Chasmatosaurus uni, is a genuinely unique species. It lived after the others, in Middle Triassic China. Whether it represents a species of Proterosuchus, or warrants its own unique genus, has yet to be determined. Either way, this Chinese species was more closely related to Proterosuchus gaurai than to the other species of Proterosuchus, indicating it was at least a direct descendant of Proterosuchus. Proterosuchus is the namesake of the clade Proterosuchidae, which was the first clade to branch off of Archosaur formes. There are some other species that may or may not be part of Proterosuchidae, the most notable being Chasmatosuchus, who shouldn't be confused with the now invalid Chasmatosaurus. The only definitive Proterosuchid, besides Proterosuchus, in the unnamed Chinese species is Archosaurus. It lived during the Permian period, in what is now Russia and Poland. Although Archosaurus was similar to Proterosuchus, its head was proportionately smaller, reflecting its lower place in the food chain. Since Archosaurus lived during the very end of the Permian period, Proterosuchidae split from the rest of Archosaur formes before the beginning of the Triassic period. 
Furthermore, both other early archosaur forms and a very close relative of the clade, the Australian Tasmaniosaurus, were also very similar to Proterosuchus. This means that the direct ancestor of the crocodilians and dinosaurs, including birds, at some point looked very similar to Proterosuchus. All definitive species of Proterosuchus are 251 to 249 million years old and are from the Lystrosaurus assembled zone in the Kauru supergroup. This site is one of the few and by far the best sites containing fossils from the early Triassic, on account of directly following the end Permian mass extinction, this environment was not very diverse. Among its inhabitants was a close relative of the archosaur forms, the previously mentioned Prolacerta. But like during the preceding Permian period, most of the large fauna were synapsids. The namesake of the assembled zone, the Dicynodont Lystrosaurus, was extremely common both in South Africa and the rest of the world. There was also a second, less common dicynodont named Maeosaurus. Eutherodonts were also present. Indeed, the Theriocephalian Moscarinus was initially the top predator of the region. However, it was eventually replaced by Proterosuchus. Moscarinus may have been the first synapsid to be outcompeted by an archosaur form, but it would not be the last. Soon, the roles would be reversed, with synapsids increasingly reduced to bit players in a world dominated by archosaur forms and their relatives, who belonged to the larger clade Archosauromorpha. However, neither Proterosuchus nor the rest of Proterosuchidae would love to see it. Just as they replaced large synapsid predators such as Moscarinus, later archosaur forms such as the Erythrosuchids replaced them. These predators were in turn replaced by even more derived archosaur forms. As time went on, archosaur formes would continue to diversify into a number of roles beyond that of small and large predators. They ruled for the rest of the Triassic period and beyond, culminating in the dinosaurs' rise to dominance. While not the direct descendants of Proterosuchus, the fact that the archosaurs were all descended from a similar, closely related species means that Proterosuchus's legacy, in a way, lives on not just in its fossilized bones, but in the crocodilians and birds of today. Thank you for watching. I hope you learned something interesting. Also, a thank you to Dominic Panetta for making art of Proterosuchus specifically for this video. If you would like to see more of his art, be sure to check out his website. There's a link to it in the description. This video is a remake of an earlier video I made. While that video is now unlisted, it can still be viewed from the link in the description if you wish to compare the two. If you enjoyed this video, please remember to hit the like button, and subscribe if you'd like to see more. Finally, be sure to have a great day.